Well, I had a very, very interesting uh, life uh, as a child. I was born at 326 North San Pedro here in Las Cruces. They didn't have any hospitals at that time, so the doctors delivered you at home, or the midwife, whoever did. And that home still exists. And I came back after I retired and I remodeled it and uh, threatened to go, come back and live there. I said, what other chief justice in the world could go back and live where he was born? So anyway, I was born in the barrio here in Las Cruces. It's about a block and a half from City Hall. <music> Elementary school, I went to a school that's no longer there, Lucero. It was on North uh, Campo, and 95% uh, of the kids that went there were Hispanos, were nativos anyway. Uh, it's a strange situation. I've told this many times. People just don't believe it. But there used to be a little ditch that ran from, from Lucero School all the way down to Central School. Central is still there. And uh, every Tuesday or Wednesday, the teachers would get us all kids together and march us down this doggone ditch to, to Central School and throw us in the showers. All of us, you know, they never asked, hey, have you taken a shower lately or anything? They, they used to, and we used to love it. We used to think it was good. Nobody thought about, hey, why are they doing this to us? I, this is discriminatory, discriminatory. We didn't care. It was okay. It was, it was nice for us. We had half a day off and we played in the, in the water. I graduated from high school in 1941. Uh, I was a member of the first basketball team that ever won a state championship for Las Cruces. That was quite a thing. That was in 41. Well, I enrolled immediately at New Mexico State University, at New Mexico A&M, and then World War II broke out in December of that year. <laughs> Yeah, I always knew that I was going to go to college somehow, but I didn't know how, and I didn't know what I was going to study. I, uh, this uncle of mine that reared me just held engineers in high regard because they built bridges, they did this and did the other. So I thought, well, heck, I've got, I'm good in math. I'll go into engineering. Well, I went into engineering, and I was having a miserable time. So I went into the service, came back after the war. I took an, a test to see what my apt, where my aptitudes were. And they were in music, they were in law, they were in salesmanship. So I changed my major from engineering to business administration with a minor in education because I thought I might be a teacher too. Well, I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew that I wanted to go to law school. And uh, so I uh, looked around, and then this friend that was in school with me, uh, Haskell Smith, he was a teacher. I don't know how he was a teacher, but he was the principal also of, uh, of old Messiah, uh, the Messiah Elementary School. So he said, hey, come with me, Dan. I'll I'll give you a job there teaching. So I went over there and I taught for one year in Nomasia. And the real thing that, where Crossroads came in, after I taught that first year, I liked it. I liked teaching school. But uh, I still wanted to go to law school. I went to teach schools to save money so that I could go to law school. And I saved nothing. I was still young and wasn't married. so. I decided, no, I better go under the GI Bill and I'll have to make it on that. I conferred with this uncle of mine that reared me, that set me off on the wrong foot about engineering. And I said, what should I do, Dick? And he said, well, I said, you know, when you go to law, it's going to take you a lot of money to go through there. And, and over here, you'll be making money and making more than you had before. So I, I think you ought to stay here and do that. And I thought, no, I went against his wishes. I went to law school. 
and uh, I was very, I'm very happy that I did. I graduated in the second graduating class of the law school. I wasn't in the first class because I stayed out one year to teach school. So they were just formulating a school and they were tougher than heck. They were really, really tough. Uh, they had professors that came to teach here at, and in New Mexico in, in retirement from other big businesses, you know. So anyway, we had the fortune of having good, good professors, but it was tough. We started out with 76 and graduated 26. MALDIF is the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. It was started for the purpose of much like the NAACP, guarding the rights, the constitutional rights of Hispanics, and also trying to seek uh, uh, educational opportunities for them. And I had a very interesting thing happen. When I was first elected to the Supreme Court, the second time that I had to run, I saw this kid that was, he was up in, in the park in, in Albuquerque, Sosa Supreme Court. Then I go to Farmington. He was up in Farmington, Sosa Supreme Court. And I thought, I went over to talk to him and I said, I know that you're a lawyer because I remember your face when we saw you in last week. But I don't know how, how I'll be able to repay you for all you're doing for me. He says, you already have Justice Sosa. I says, what do you mean? He said, well, you're one of the founders of Maldiv. I'm one of the beneficiaries of Maldiv. They paid for all my legal education. And so he said, you've already paid me. I said, bendito sea Dios, isn't that something? Well, I was appointed to the Supreme Court in August of 1975. I uh, went up there with much trepidation, <laughs> you know, very, con very, very, very concerned about how I could do on the Supreme Court. Because I didn't, I never served as a district judge. I served as a city judge, but never as a district judge. And here I was going to go on a Supreme Court that looks over the faults and derelictions of duties of, of district judges, you know. Well, in any event, I was concerned. But I went up there and I loved it. I thought it was great. Five people getting together and deciding an issue and deciding what the opinion was going to be and who was going to write it and uh, what the, uh, uh, if there was going to be any dissent and what the dissent was going to be about. I, I loved it. Then I started looking at some figures and I saw that at that time when I was looking, 50, 56 justices had served New Mexico since statehood. And I had served longer than all but three or four so I figured, no, golly, it's about time for me to get out. So that's when I, I went ahead and, and left the court and came back home. So it was during my second to last year in law school that I met Rita. I uh, crashed a wedding party with her cousin, with Tito, Tito Quintana. <laughs> and uh, as we were, went to the party, we were, uh, this was a reception, uh, she came over and Tito introduced me to her. This is my, my prima, Rita. And I said, well, hi, Rita, how are you? So I danced with her. And I had a good time that time, and then that was it. That was my first encounter with meeting her. Oh, about two or three weeks later, I was at the El Dorado, at the De Vargas Hotel in Santa Fe, and this lady passed by with, with Rosie Moya. So I called Rosie. I said, Rosie, who was that gorgeous girl that you were with? And she said, she's Rita Ortiz. You met her at, at Tessie's wedding. And I said, oh, my gosh, do you know her number? So she gave me her phone number. And I called her, and we went out. And we went out for fiestas that year. And we were married for fiestas the following year. So that it happened fast. The kids used to say when they were kids, they were going to grow up and they were going to go to all different parts of the world. 
uh, Rita Jo was going to be a brain surgeon. And I said, that's great. That's good. All of you do that and go to different parts of the world. Then when I retire, I'll go visit each one of you. We're going to have 12 kids, you know. We'll go visit each one of you. Spend each, one month with each of you. We won't make ourselves plastas. Well, one month, and then you won't be tired of us, and we'll, we'll enjoy our trip. But heck. None of them have even left New Mexico. They're all here. <laughs> they love it here. <laughs> so anyway, that's where we're at. Well, he told me that, that uh, if I recall correctly, that I, that I, I had, he selected me, that he, I had been selected upon the recommendation of somebody. And he said he agreed with it because he said, I've never always agreed with you politically, but I've always respected what you've done. So anyway, basically that was it. Oh, that I would be wise. It is very difficult to uh, give words of wisdom to kids that are already wise in themselves. I guess the best thing that I could say would be follow your instincts and don't ever abandon what your true love is with reference to pursuing a, a goal. Uh, if you, uh, nothing is ever too hard that you can't surmount it if you just put your mind to it. And uh, that's about it. That's, yeah, I always kid people and say, well, you know, Keep on going. The first hundred years are the hard hardest. It's a lot easier after the first hundred years. <laughs> <laughs>